Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, today I'm not going to highlight, okay, I'm not just up here highlighting what God did. When you come to Elevate Church, I'm not just here to tell you Bible stories of what God did in the past. How many know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? So we don't just read the Bible as if it was a history book. No, the Bible is living and it's active. So I'm not highlighting. I'm here to remind you that the church is still moving forward, that God still wants to do something incredible and amazing in you and through you. But we have to get that revelation for ourselves. And I pray that today I do that. Look at your neighbor and say to them, don't get up today. Look at your other neighbor and say, your phone better be on silent. And look at another neighbor and say, let's go deeper today. How many know, obviously, without, without, without any doubt, that every single one of us understand that water today comes from a source? How many believe that? Well, and most of us would agree and say, well, obviously, God is the one who gives that source, water, right? He provides it. But how many know that God can provide something, but he needs a resource to contain it? That'll preach right there. I ain't preaching on that today. But I'm just trying to tell you, if you believe that God is the source of the water, the rain that we receive here on this earth, that's awesome. But God always needs something to contain the blessing that he wants to fill in someone's life. And for us that live in Santa Clarita, or maybe you live locally somewhere, we contain water in places called reservoirs like this one right here castaic lake california you guys are going to move fast today that's castaic i catch a lot of bass there trout striper it's a great place but it's our reservoir it's the place where we contain and hold our water it's our well where we get water from where we draw water from for this community this city which is awesome but how many know that there are still places around the world that people depend on wells to survive. To this day, we're talking third world generations or, 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 or nations that are in need and desperate to dig wells. Everybody say dig. Yeah, in other words, they got to dig deep these huge, ginormous wells in order to begin to bring the water that God the Father has already provided. And then you see amazing, beautiful things that happen. Well, I want you to know that when, when you're hearing me share the scripture, like we were talking last week, for those that weren't here, you can watch live stream. I'll recap a little bit. We were talking about Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How many know that God is a God of generations, right? So Abraham, Isaac's father, left a well of blessing. Not just one well, many wells. Many wells, it was provision. He was passing on a blessing. He was passing on a bunch of amazing things that Abraham worked so hard for in order for Isaac to have provision for his vision. And it was amazing. And so when you look in the Bible times, wells were vital to every single community in order to have life. How many know that many of us can go without food for a good amount of time, but you can't go without water? If you lack water, what happens to you? You die. You die. If you don't get water inside your body, I mean, our body's already made up of like 80% water, right? We need water in order to survive. So just think about this. Isaac is in a very deep famine. It wasn't just a famine of lack of food. It was a famine of water. There was like no water in the land. And so here you have Isaac who, who is left this blessing by his father Abraham so that whenever God the father would would rain down his his water his physical water the wells would be filled and then that would be provision for Isaac and his family and so forth let's look at what happens here because Isaac was coming to a place to drink water not only for himself but also for his cattle and many times when you read the Bible you're like man why are these guys always walking with cattle like is that their homies or what what is that well, let me tell you something. The currency of then was cattle. The currency of today is your cash. So Isaac was blessed. God, 
God used Abraham to leave him not only these wells where they provide the water, the necessity in order for them to produce the crops they need, but anytime you hear in the Bible about these great men and women of God that had cattle and sheep, that was their currency. So how many know that Isaac was not poor? He was rich. He was blessed but he not only have tangible blessings he had spiritual blessing his father left something amazing for him and so now you have Isaac he comes to the wells let's read in Genesis 26 17 and 18 he says then Isaac departed from there and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and he dwelt there in other words Isaac was thinking about leaving this 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 desert where where his father Abraham had already dug a bunch of wells for them. But what happens is the enemy comes up, comes in, shows up, and starts doing something that's just so wicked and evil. It says, and Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Listen, Isaac was coming to be blessed by what his father left him. And he shows up on the scene. And now every single well that Abraham had dug for his son Isaac is now clogged up. That's just like you and I. I mean, we have a heavenly father who has left us a divine well of purpose, a divine well of promise, a divine well of restoration, a divine well of reconciliation, a divine hell of uh, a well of healing, a divine well of power. And then what does the enemy do? He comes and he cogs up the spiritual arteries of the church. Like, you know that there's a promise for your life. You know that God has something significant for your life. But somehow along the way, as you start aging, you start seeing your spiritual life clogged up with all kinds of junk. Stuff that we experience. Sometimes it's stuff that we created and sometimes it's stuff that we were surprised with. Sometimes it was things that you had no control over. But regardless, how many know that God knows how to dig up a well again with your help and he can fill that well again? That's what God wants to do with many of you today. Many of us. And we know that water is essential to life. Without water, there is no life. And without it, we die. And so Isaac is facing a famine that was worse than his father's famine. So think about this. It was worse than his father Abraham. I pray that your children don't have it as bad as you've had it now. I pray that your children have it better than you have it. I pray that your children, maybe you're someone that you're already up in age and, and you were not able to own that house that you've always wanted, but that you would leave something for your children that gives them the capacity to go and obtain whatever promise God has for them. But not just the tangibles. The greatest thing that you can leave your child is a spiritual well of blessing. There's nothing greater than that. I'm talking to parents now. Don't, wor don't worry, singles. I'm coming for you. You're next. And so here you have Abraham. He left his son a well of, of blessing. The enemy comes in at night. The Philistine were envious. They were haters. And, and, and they went there in the middle of the night, and they clogged every single well. And I get, I get what happens when, when you're well of blessing, when you're well of promise. Because many of you, 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 you know that God has something. Maybe there's healing you've been waiting for, but it's clogged. Maybe, maybe there's restoration you're waiting for, but it's clogged. Maybe there's this financial breakthrough that you're waiting for, but it's clogged. Maybe there's, a, a, you want to you wanna start a family one day. You want to get married one day, but it's clogged. And, and God is about getting us Unclog. God is about getting his people to go to work and begin to dig again. Because so many times you can stay in the place of disappointment and you'll live there for the rest of your life. And you can't blame God. If you're in a very low place in your life, you can't just sit there. I'm just waiting for God to undig this well. God's saying, no, I'm waiting for you to put your hand to the plow and start digging. And when you start digging, God says, I'll start filling. And so wherever you're at, get some help. Get connected. Do something. But you don't just sit there and just wait. We dig again. We dig again. Say with me. I dig again. 
That's what God wants us to do. And so the enemy comes. But here's, but here's the beautiful thing. And I want, if you're a note taker, take this note. If you're not a note taker, you can become a note taker today for free 99. All right. Are you ready? When one generation is faithful, it is possible to store up for the next generation. When, with, when one generation is faithful, it is possible to store up, lay up, build up for the next generation. It's possible. See, the very thing that you're doing right now is affecting your right now, but it also affects the next generation. The very thing you're doing, you sitting in church right now is affecting for those that are parents, your children that are in children's ministry, your family, your marriage, whatever it is. The very thing I'm doing right now, when you worship God, when you lift up hands, when you sing to God, you are affecting the next generation. Parents, when, you're, when your children see you worship they will worship. When they see you read your Bible, they will read your Bible. When they see you go to church, they will go to church. When they see you be generous in your finances and building God's kingdom, they will also build God's kingdom. Whatever it is you're doing right now, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's affecting you, but it's also affecting the next generation. It's affecting us now I'm not trying to be a downer maybe you're here today and you're being affected with some serious issues with some serious stuff in your personal life but how many know that God has the power God has given you the authority God has given you the name above any name above any clog and his name is Jesus and with Jesus help he can unclog anything that you're facing right now anything <laughs> so it's possible that we can change this we gotta, we got to think this way, guys. We are storing up for the future. We are laying up for the future. And for you single people, I got no kids. Well, guess what? You're training so that one day when you do have kids, you've already stored up a well of blessings. So when they're born, they already get to drink out of that well. Amen? I don't want any kids. Well, guess what? Then you can go ahead and begin to just... Dig up a well of blessings so that you can leave something for your family, your nieces, your nephews. But it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you. God loves you. God wants to provide for you. God wants to answer your prayer. But at some point, you have to have some spiritual maturity to stop making it all about you and realize that the devil is going to keep you inward focused, but God is going to keep you outward focused. That's what God does. It's a quiet Catholic church this morning. I love the Catholics. They're faithful. I always go to church. Christians, eh. Just saying. Everybody say, not just a physical blessing. I got to leave a spiritual blessing. Come on, we have to leave something. Um, let me see. Uh, is Nevaeh here? Yeah, get up here, girl. Run up here, please. Run like the wind. Let me, let me see who else am I going to use here. Mm -hmm. I may just pick you out out of the audience, so don't don't trip. Don't hate you. Right here. Yes. Come on up, girl. She's like, darn it, why'd I go to church today? <laughs> don't worry, I'm not gonna have you say anything. I just need you as let's give them a big hand, please, real quick. <laughs> Thank you so much. Come on up, follow me. And you stand right here, please. What's your name? Miriam. Miriam, very nice to meet you, Miriam. Miriam and Navea. So check this out. Here's the deal. So this is what I've been talking about. If you weren't here last week, you're here this week. God is the God of generations. Abraham left a well for Isaac. Isaac left a well for Jacob. Then Jesus shows up at Jacob's well. He meets a woman who's thirsty. He said, girl, you can drink out of this well, but you're going to be thirsty because you're coming back. But if you drink from my well, how many know that Jesus is the well of life? Jesus is the water of our life. And he says, you come to me and you watch what I'll do. So here's what it looks like. So we have this generation here. This is our generation. This is our generation right now for all of us older people right here. Let me see all my older people in the house. This is our generation. It's our generation. And then Nevaeh here, she's about 12, 13 years old, okay? This is the next generation. We right now. 
those that are doing something to serve God right now, whatever it is you're doing, whether it's right or wrong, it is going to affect this generation, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Now, maybe you've already done stuff in your life. Your kids are older and you're like, dang, I wish I would have heard your message like 10 years ago, 20 years ago. That's okay because even when Isaac's blessing was clogged, God still gave Isaac an answer. Pick up the, 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 the plow and start digging again and I'll fill it. Amen? So there ain't, no, there's no need to trip. So our job here is to turn this way. Boom. And your job is to start walking towards her. Come on. He said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of what? Men. And then she puts her arms. Yeah, you can stay with her. Love on her. What do we do? We, we, are to, we are to ignite. We are to activate. We are to empower. We are to encourage. We are to stir up the gift that's within this generation. We are to tell this generation, yes, you can. Yes, you will. If God be for you, who can be against you? But the church is silent. The church is quiet. You know why? Because the church is too consumed with themselves that it's hard to see that there's a generation that needs you. But it starts right now, right here. And then we can start facing this generation. Now, I'm going to give you a quick commercial. Parents, you better send your kids to youth camp with us this year. <laughs> better send your Give them a big hand. Come on. Proverbs 29, 18, hurry up. Let's get out of here. It says, where there is no, I, this is where we work together. <laughs> I'm not a charismatic preacher. I'm just loud. Where there is no, vision. where there is no, vision. where there is no, vision. okay, check this out. Where there is no vision, the people die. When, listen. You may be someone here, your translation of a drought, of a famine, is not the language of the Bible times. Most of us today, our language of famine is this, disappointment, disillusion, angry, upset, doubt, fear. Uh, we, lack, we lack seeing something better for our life. That's our famine. That's what we do in our culture today. But, but I'm here to tell you that the only thing that will keep you in that place is when you don't have a vision from God. When you don't have a vision from God, you are bored. And people that are bored end up sinning. I'm going to say that again. When you don't have a vision from God for you, your family, your life, when you are bored, that is when the tempter comes to tempt. Why? You got nothing going on. That's why he says that the devil, he, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking Who's bored? You can't, listen, you can't throw off a person that is laser focused on a vision. Not that you're not going to be challenged because you will be challenged. Not that you're not going to go through struggles because you will go through struggles. Not that you're not going to go through pain because you will go through pain. Not that you won't face some trauma because we all will face some form of trauma. But there is a God who knows how to put a plow in your hand and he says, now dig. Now dig. And that's what God wants us to do. Now let's keep talking here. So he says, where there is no vision, the people perish, the people die. But he, everybody say but. but. See, you just need a but in your life, but a good one. There's bad buts and there's good buts. But he or she that keeps God's word, happy is he, she. <laughs> happy. If you're unhappy... You know what unhappy people do? They try to find validation in all the wrong places. You want to experience true happiness? Get back to God. Press him back to God. And you'll be happy again. Amen? Because that's where your joy comes from. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You're not going to get it anywhere else. You can, try, you can lose years of your life and wake up one day and you're still unhappy. And then you show up to a church called Elevate like today. Like maybe you're here today. You've been gone for a long time. You've just been struggling. You've been hurting. But you're here and you're like, man, I'm finding hope. Well, guess what? There is hope for everyone today. But he says, happy is he who keeps the word of God. And so let me just give you an explanation of vision. So do you guys know the story of the woman with the issue of blood? So there's this woman. She's got an issue of a flowing 
blood. Can you imagine just physically how she felt? Tired, exhausted, weak. Man, she spent all her money, the Bible says. She went to doctors. She went to specialists. She went to acupuncture. She went to anything and everything that was out there. She spent everything she had that now she's broke. She's got nothing. She has no family. You know why? Because in those times, if you were a woman and if you had any issue of blood, any flow of blood, you were looked at as unclean, unfit, not worthy, and you definitely were excommunicated from the public of anyone. That meant that you were isolated, you were alone. So just think about not just the physical, but the emotional issues this woman was dealing with. Now, you may not have an issue of blood, especially us men, but let me tell you something. But I know that all of us have at least an issue. All of us here. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. And, look, and, and the other person, you tell him, he's talking to you too. We all got issues. Our issues have issues. We all have issues. So check this out. There's a guy named Jairus who comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, please come. My 12-year-old daughter is sick. She is at the point of death. Jesus says, I'll come. So while Jesus was coming to the 12-year-old girl, little girl that was at the point of death, the woman with the 12-year issue of blood has this bright idea to say, you know what? Nothing's worked for me. I've already gone to psychologists, already gone to therapists. I've already gone to every kind of specialist there is out there. Nothing has worked. I'm empty. I'm, I feel void. I feel ugly. I feel stupid. I feel whatever. And she said, I, I, I heard about this Jesus. And, and I hear he's going to be walking right through this little town right here. So she decided when he comes, I know I'm not allowed to be in public. I know that I'm supposed to be isolated. I know that I'm supposed to stay away. But she began to premeditate her healing in her mind. And what she did is what we all need to do. When you're at the driest place of your life, when you're at the most broken place of your life, that's the time where you press in. So this woman pressed in through all the crowd, literally. I mean, you talk about football. This woman literally got in, and she touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says that immediately that the flow of blood stopped just like that. And so the Lord ministered to this woman. He stopped and he said, woman, your faith has made you well. Stay with me. We talked about generations. Where was Jesus going? Jesus was going to the next generation. But someone from this generation finally came to the conclusion, I got to stop this noise and I got to press in. And because she pressed in to Jesus, she, because she was willing to dive in and touch Jesus, Jesus was willing to touch her. He didn't even touch her. Power just left him, but it was her faith. This is the generation. If you and I are of this generation, then we better step up our faith game because it will reflect, it will, it will affect also the next generation to come. Now watch this. So now we have Jesus. So this woman is healed, and now she's out and about doing her thing, going live, preaching the gospel, telling everybody what they did, what, what Jesus did for her. Now Jesus goes to the next generation. And he shows up and they said, Master, uh, it's too late. Uh, my daughter's dead. The people around Jairus, the, 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 the family members, the, the rulers, the religious people were saying, don't even bother. The, don't bother him. She, she's, she's dead. She's done. And you know what Jesus said? She, he looked at the parents and said, hey, listen, y'all need to just chill. I'm the same yesterday generation today and forevermore your daughter is not dead she's just sleeping what does jesus do we started with the woman with the 12 years she pressed we started with the next uh, generation the 12 year old girl he touched what am i saying i'm saying that god is going to do greater things than the former 
days of our generation. God is going to touch our next generation, but he's going to bring resurrection power. But it's going to start with the people of God that are willing to have faith to believe for the next generation. I'm telling you right now, parent, you're leaving something behind. And hopefully it's an open well of blessing or it's a clogged well. That means, that means when Jesus touches something, it's going to be revived. When Jesus touches something, there's an awakening. When Jesus touches someone's life, there's transformation. There's renewal. Or you can be the generation that says, okay, well, he just cares about the next generation. No, he needs, he needs, he needs a, a, a man with an issue. He needs a woman with an issue because once you get rocked by God, once he ministers to you, once he looks at you and says, man, your faith has made you well, now this generation can impact the next one. So we got work to do, don't we, guys? I'm telling you, Jesus wants to touch our generation right now. The world has said about this generation that the church is silent, that the church is weak, that, I mean, just watch, watch the news. They're, they're, they're the church, they, they, they treat the church like, like we're going to tell the church what to do. And the church just sits by like, oh, okay, no, we're not going to sit by. We're not going to be okay. It's unacceptable. We're not going to go ahead and just, you know, succumb to the world's values or the world system no we have to come to the place of faith and say no i'm gonna stand up i'm gonna stand out and i'm gonna speak out the gospel of jesus christ i have to be different there's got to be something different about you if not we look like the rest of the world and god loves the world he loved them so much that he sent he gave gave generous giver willing to sacrifice his son's life but i believe that in our culture today we have cheapened the gospel we have we've cheapened it i'm when i i'm not, I'm not talking about us right here don't get bent out of shape i'm talking about the body of christ we've cheapened it it's it's like the word's not enough for us anymore no, I, I want to hear something else. You know, yes, we do at the movies and all that, but let me tell you something. Don't get it twisted. We are a spirit-filled, Holy Ghost church that never, never, ever gets away from God's word. The movie doesn't make the word. The word will make the movie even better. Amen? Amen? So I'm not here to tickle anyone's ears. We're just creative as a church. God's the creator of creativity, huh? Yeah, we like creativity here at this house. Huh? Listen, when God touches the next generation, it's stronger than the former one. I'm telling you right now. When God gets a hold, man, he's going to do something amazing. It's time to patch the torch. Come on, parents. you got to go ahead from here, from, from us being here, and we got to turn to the next generation. we got to do something. That's why single people, stop making excuses. Listen, once you're married, you're busy. You should be using your single life not to be consumed with you. You should be using your life right now to serve it all for Jesus. Right now, this is your opportunity because once you get married, guess what? You're busy. You got babies coming. You know, you have life. You got, you get, you're taking care of your family. Now, does that mean that you stop serving God? No, it doesn't mean you stop serving God. But it does mean that God has given you a span of life. And when you stand before him, he is going to take account of your life and my life. You can be the person that's just living to survive. You're just trying to pay the mortgage or you're just trying to pay the rent. You're just trying to get enough money to pay the bills. You're just trying to get enough money to have a car that's working fine. Or you're just trying to get as much as I can, get my motorcycle, my cars, my house, those things are great. But let me tell you something. When you stand before God, God's not going to say, hey, let's look at all of your possessions. No, he's going to say, hey, what did you do with the life I gave you? Well, I became a great doctor. Great doctor. How many souls did you bring with you? I was a great lawyer. Great lawyer. How many souls did you bring into my kingdom? Because the only thing you can bring to heaven with you are souls. What did you leave for your children and your children's children? 
because God is a God of generations. Amen? Are you guys okay? I love this because here's the deal. If you're buried right now with addiction, if you're buried with sickness, disease, if you're buried with depression, if you're buried with anxiety, if you're buried with disappointment, anger, unbelief, let me tell you something. Today, God wants to dig a new well in you. He has resurrection power for every single one of us. I have, uh, we have this great friend. Her name is Rosie Orozco. And, um, you know, not only do we do eKids Global here at Elevate Church, uh, but my wife and I, we're directors of Zoe International Mexico. And um, we combat and fight child human trafficking. Now, our school is more of a prevention from children at risk of being labor trafficked. But Mexico is a whole other beast, let me tell you. I was in Japan. I met with the Zoe team in Japan. I've been to Thailand, met with the Zoe. It all looks different in every country. And even when we had a film crew that came to film with us in Mexico, it was, they said, we have been to many parts of the world for human trafficking, and we've never seen it, have seen it as bold and as evil and as dark as Mexico. Now, I'm Mexican. I can talk about Mexico. So don't trip. Don't be sending me no email. Why are you talking about Mexican? Because I'm Mexican. <laughs> In Mexico City alone right now, there are 70,000 people being sex trafficked right now at this moment. Seven, just in the city, 70,000. And Rosy Orozco is someone that had a burden, a passion. She saw a clogged well called Mexico. And she said, God, I can't keep seeing this happen. I have to do something about it. God said, okay, pick up, pick up your, your plow and start digging. So you know what she did? She decided, and mind you, they're pastors right now of a church. She decided to start going into the political arena. She made it all the way to Congress. The woman is the one who established in the last 10 to 14 years, has established every law that fights and combats any form of human trafficking in Mexico. She was actually the one who wrote the laws, became a lawyer, went to Congress, and wrote every law that exists in Mexico. Now, mind you, God can take any person from any background. Rosie Orozco did not come from a silver spoon. She didn't come from having it all. This was a woman who is filled with the Spirit of God and who was ignited and who saw injustice and who saw a world that needed a Savior, and his name is Jesus. Today, in Forbes magazine of the most powerful women, she's the 11th most powerful woman in the world. That's a, that's a golf clap. You need to give God a, a praise clap. You give honor to whom honors do. That woman is no joke. In Mexico, it's not like, oh, yay, we do human trafficking. No. There's the drug cartel, and that's bad, right? Well, let me tell you, as we've been working in Mexico for the last two years on trying to figure out, okay, God, what are we going to do here when it comes to human trafficking? Because this is dangerous. There's 45 human trafficking cartels now that have been birthed in Mexico. And who now work together with the drug cartel. So they work with each other. So when, when you think about something like that, see the first thing your flesh does is it goes into that fear state. But when God calls you, he equips you. And when he equips you, he sends you. So don't be afraid. I ain't saying any of you have to go do that. I'm just saying that God is a respecter of no person. God's not looking for degrees. God's not looking for diplomas. God's not looking for you to be this well-versed person. God's not looking for this amazing, eloquent speaker. God's just looking for some available Christians that are willing to pick up their cross and follow him. That's all he's looking for. God will do the rest. Now, I'm not saying that if you have intelligence, that's not important. If you have intelligence, dang, you got the plus plus. You're blessed. You're super blessed. And so... 
as we were meeting in the last two years, we've been trying to figure it out and, and like, what are we going to do? And so Rosie was telling me that she does this conference at her church because they're pastors as well. They're like, yeah, we do this women's event. And because the women, man, they're the bosses in Mexico. I hate to say it. Mexican women, you, you boss. The men, we just provide in Mexico, right? Well, it ain't like that for me, but I'm just saying, you know, that's the way it is in Mexico. The women got the chancla in Mexico, man. It's just like, they got power. No, seriously. And so the women are the voices in Mexico. They're, they're the authority. And so she's been doing this conference and, uh, and, and, and doing prevention and awareness every year. And, of course, she's rescued uh, many women who've been sex trafficked, raped 25 times a day for 4, 5, 10 years, who are now, let me tell you something, it's not just rescue them and, okay, let's give you a safe place to live. No, it's rescue them and save them and restore them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All Listen, I've already met those, a lot of those girls that have already been saved from human trafficking, met them. These are women now who are advocates for sex trafficking. They've been on every possible network worldwide from Fox to CNN to anything. They've been with the Pope a bazillion times. They've been speaking in different parts of the world. We're talking a woman who's not just doing a service to an injustice situation, but a woman who is discipling, who is passing the torch because these are young girls now that are coming behind her that are the next future spokespeople for, for the next generation. And so we were, we were talking and I said, Rosie, I said, okay, you know, we've all been trying to figure out what does God want to do and, uh, with Zoe, Mexico. And, and uh, I said, I think I, I think I got it now. We need to stay safe just as we start, just to kind of get our feet wet. I think we should go ahead and do a huge conference. And if we do a huge conference, I said, let's get like, you know, 2,000 women uh, or so. And what's, I'm like, so what stadium is there here in Mexico City? And she said, it's the Blackberry. I'm like, oh, the Blackberry. I'm like, how many is that sit? She's like, 3,000. I said, okay, well, let's go ahead and let's, let's, go, let's dig a well, a revival, and bring awareness to, to, to sex trafficking in Mexico. And if the women are like the chancla women, I'm like, man, can you imagine we get like 3,000 chanclas? Man, we could, we'll, ch- we'll jack this place up. And so we started with that. She said, okay. She's like, okay, let me get my people, and we'll start figuring out uh, what we can do at the Blackberry. So she goes ahead, and she calls me back. She's like, okay, uh, this is how much it's going to cost. It's going to be dinero. I'm like, okay, how much? She's like, whoa, help me, Jesus, right? And so we went ahead, and we, we went for it. And we just started with just a simple little dream. See, so many of us, we think we have to have the whole picture. God's just saying, can you just trust the mustard seed? Watch this video. Atrévete a compartir tu fe, a conquistar tus sueños, el evento que te retará a crecer. Rosy Orozco, Rebeca Bremer, Diana Aristizábal, Norma Ruiz, Carol Hart, Rita Hernández, Ángela Jaquit, Carla Hurnung. Virginia Ruiz Y en la música Victoria Hernández Septiembre 20 y 21 Auditorio Blackberry Atrévete Inscríbete ya So let me tell you something How do we do that? I have no idea We didn't even have all those speakers Most of those women preachers you saw up there they're from all the different parts of Latin America. They got churches of 50,000 to 100,000 members. And the moment they heard the vision, where there is no vision, the people what? Shared. Shared the vision. They all started talking. And I know we have that one girl that she's very well known in music. But I called our pastor from Elevate Oaxaca. And he's like well known in the industry. He got just about every big name worship leader that's going to be there with us. And then he's like, and your daughter needs to come and lead as well. And it's going to be ridiculous, crazy, amazing. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I wish I could tell you that it was just like, bam, we got this. A week later, they called me. They said, it ain't happening. I'm like, what the? It ain't happening. And they took the money. I'm like, what the? I'm about to leave my salvation over here because I was angry. Can I say angry in church? Is that, is that okay? I don't want to offend anyone here. I was, the pastor was angry. I was 
ticked. I was upset because you know what we did? We went in there for two years and we started digging and we kept digging. We kept digging. We're like, okay, God, you're going to bless Mexico. Come on, all those people that are being sex trafficked, they're going to be saved. God, I don't know how. I don't even have the money. We don't have the money. Nobody has the money, but you have the money. You said that you own a cattle on a thousand hills, and they belong to you. So, God, so we just kept digging and digging and digging. And let me tell you something. A week later, the well was clogged. So what did we do? We dig again. And three to four weeks later, kept digging. I was so ticked for three, four weeks. I was frustrated. We just kept going at it. No, what about this? What about that? What about this? No, no, we need to talk to that. No, I don't care. You should have seen my emails. They they weren't that nice. No, what do you mean? No, we already said. and And let me tell you something. It was a battle of three to four weeks. But how many know that at the, at the, at the 12th hour, huh? Like, like when Paul was in prison. Right at midnight, boom, the, the, the prison doors were open. And now, I'll tell you, all this has come out. I didn't realize we had this many speakers now. It's ridiculous. And then getting the, the, the message from our pastor in Oaxaca, Mexico, saying, man, the lineup is set. Let me tell you something. When the enemy comes to bury your well of blessing, you dig again. And you dig again, and you dig again, and you dig again, and you dig again, and you don't stop digging until you do what God promised. Amen. And the conference is called Atrevete. You know what that Atrevete means? It means dare yourself. I double dog dare you to obey God. I double dog dare you to follow Jesus. I double dog dare you. See, you don't have to deal with cartels. All you have to deal with is your coworkers that need Jesus. You don't have to deal with, with, with wondering if you're going to disrupt the cartel's business because it's a, a one point or 150 billion industry, dollar industry per year. 150 billion dollars is sex trafficking. That's the profit. When you interrupt stuff like that, that gets crazy. What are you, what are you worried about? Sharing your faith with your coworker? Oh, I don't want to offend them. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to disrespect someone else's belief system. Well, you probably have already disrespected yours because you don't have the courage to believe what you believe. So what are you ashamed about? I'm not putting no one down. I'm just bringing some reality here. I'm just bringing some truth. Are you listening to me today? Are you listening to him? And so... I'm telling you, there's something about this. I'm going to end with this so we can get out of here. Y'all look tired. I'm still on time. Just stay with me. When you read the book of Acts in your Bible, those weren't the acts of God. Those were the acts of the disciples. I'm here to tell you that God did what he did. Now we need to do what we're supposed to do. And Peter and John are arrested. And and there's this Sadducee ruler who has them in court. And and he threatened them. Anyone being threatened because of your Christian faith here? Anyone here at all? I don't think so. And, and the Sadducee ruler threatened them, Peter and John, and said, if you, if you say Jesus, if you preach Jesus, if you keep talking about Jesus, if you even, even paint the picture of Jesus, we will kill you. And then John and Peter responded with this this obviously life-changing conversation this dialogue was so profound i guess you're talking about two guys that don't have like two nickels to rub together you're talking about two guys that were just in love with christ yes you can be a man and love jesus so man up and and they're standing 
before this Sadducee and they start having this conversation. Look at Acts chapter 4 quickly. They said, we won't stop preaching. We won't comp compromise our faith. We won't compromise our walk with God. We're going to keep preaching Jesus. And I'm sure the conversation was deeper. It must have been so deep that look what they said. This is what the Sadducee said. When they saw, we're talking all the rulers at our table in court. When they saw the what? Come on, church, y'all. Wake up, man. Let's try this again. When they saw the? Courage. Thank you. When they saw the courage. See, that's all God needs. He just needs someone who's willing to have a little bit of courage. Of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled. Come on. They had no education. They had no training. They had no degrees. They had no university. They had no seminary. They had they had no monies. They had they had nothing. They were unschooled. They were ordinary men. Ever say ordinary? They were just ordinary men. Just like you, we're ordinary. Just ordinary men, ordinary followers of Jesus Christ. They were astonished. And they took notes. They started taking notes while they're in the meeting. Like, what the? They said, you know what? We know they're uneducated. We know they're unschooled. We know they're not qualified. We know they're not worthy. We know that they're not all that. We know that they're no one special. And, and the only thing after taking account of what we heard them say, we cannot deny that they have been with Jesus. See, they can deny that you ain't qualified. People of the world can tell you, you ain't qualified. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not worthy of it. Let me tell you something. The world has told me that. But the world can't deny that I've been with Jesus. People can, people can put you down. People can say the worst about you, but you always remind yourself, yeah, but I've been with Jesus. I mean, they were astonished. They were, they were shocked of what they were hearing. They were, they were like blown away that these were ordinary men with no education, no training. But the one thing they knew is that they were with Jesus. You know what that tells me? Wow. And you can spell it both ways, W-O-W -W or W-O back, front words back. I'm like, man, there's hope for me, Mauricio. Wow. There's hope for me. Because I don't have seminary. I always get people to get weird. Sometimes you got religious people coming here like, what school did you go to? I didn't go to school. I spent all this time, four hours a day reading the Bible. Every day of my life. Every day in the presence of God. Praying to God, what? You mean you didn't go to seminary? No, nope, never been there. Seminary or cemetery? Which I've been to the cemetery. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm untrained, unschooled. I'm not, I'm not sure. Cemetery I've been to, yeah. Seminary never, no. And, and you know, and we've had people that have straight up said, oh, and walk away from me like that. I'm like, man, you're lucky I ain't, I'm saved. <laughs> you are, you're lucky because I, if, yeah, I don't want to go there, okay. Yeah, but you know what? But they can't deny that I've been with Jesus. You can, listen, unqualify me, disqualify me. I don't care what you do. Let them disqualify you. Let them tell you you're not. Who gives a rip what they think? Let the walk do the talk. Let the cross show the power of God in your life. As a matter of fact, when you take that word ordinary, do you realize that? This is pretty interesting. The Greek word of ordinary, the original word of ordinary, if you guys can put my definition, it means idiotis. It's it's an original Greek word, and here's what it, it means an ignorant or unlearned person. It also means idiot. Idiot. Do I have any idiots in the house? I don't, don't stay with me. We're gonna have a lot real soon. Hold on. So the writer, listen, the writer, I'm, I'm almost done here. So the writer, the writer who's writing this passage is trying to be soft and gentle, ordinary. Just keeping it, you know, because we just want to keep it, you know, ordinary. But the original word, the original meaning of an ordinary person is labeled idiot. 
that means that the people, when they said these are ordinary men, they said these are idiots. They're uneducated, unschooled, unlikely to succeed, unlikely to have success, unlikely to do anything on this earth. But they had, they had this dynamic courage. They said, we can't deny, they got some, dyna some dynamics. They got some power, man. They, 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 they got influence. They, and, and, and they started thinking about, man, uh, how is it that Jesus would pick people like them? Do you realize that when you look at the Bible, when you read the Bible, who did Jesus call? He always called the uneducated. He always called the tax collectors. He always called the prostitutes. Yes, prostitutes. He called the lowest of the lowest. He called the outcast, like the woman of the issue of blood, like the woman at the well. Huh? God used the worst of the worst. Peter had a cuss issue. Paul, was, I mean, uh, uh, David was an adulterer. Paul was a, a terrorist. He calls the ones that others said could not make a difference. But notice who Jesus did not call. He did not call not one single religious person. He didn't call someone that thought that they've arrived and they know it all. He even, listen, what's really sad, even in America right now, and I hate to say it about the church, but it's the truth. Can I be real? The truth Man, there's still churches today. God said, build for me a, a holy nation. We build denominations. And today in denominations, you know what they say? When they're looking for a, a pastor to come and take a position, there are three requirements in ministry that you need to have in most churches nowadays. Number one, you must have at least five years experience in order to be a pastor. Five years experience in ministry. Number two, you must have gone to seminary school. Number three, you must be married. Don't worry, you're good, Felicia. <laughs> you must be. You know what I think about that? When you, when you think about that, it's like, oh, my God, what has happened to us, church? Because in the book of Acts, there was none of that. What is wrong with us? I'll take it a step further. If Jesus was living in this time, He'd be disqualified because he only had a public ministry for three years. He didn't have five years experience. He had three years experience. He didn't go to seminary school. And definitely he wasn't married. So they would have been like, oh, <laughs> sorry, Jesus. <laughs> you know, maybe come back next time. <laughs> next time, have a little bit more experience. Next time, maybe bring some some of your certificates with you so that we can see that God the Father actually sent you. Talk to God. Maybe he can give you a wife. You know what? You know who disqualifies you the most? You. You disqualify you. Who gave, who gave you the right to disqualify you? Who gave you permission? I'll tell you who. The enemy who came and filled your well. That's who. Wow. I got so much to say. So who's he looking for then, Pastor? Number one, he's looking for people who know what it's like to be forgiven. Anyone here been forgiven? Number two. He's looking for people who know what it's like to be healed. Has anyone been healed? He's looking for people who know what it's like to be transformed. He's looking for people who know or who don't care what the world thinks because they live with audacious face. God is looking for some idiots. Not reg listen, not regular idiots because there's a lot of those. I'm talking about spiritual idiots. I'm talking about ordinary men and women that God will make extraordinary for his holy purposes on this earth. Any idiots in the house today with a raise of hand if you're an idiot for heaven? Come on, God is looking for naive idiots that actually believe in his power. For some naive idiots that actually believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some naive idiots that are willing to trust him when God says, 
give, you give. When God says serve, you serve. When God says bless, you bless. When God says forgive, you forgive. But they don't deserve it, but you forgive because I'm an idiot. That's what God's looking for. Give God a big hand clap, amen? <laughs> Bigger than that, come on, we're talking about God, not me. Give Jesus, just say thank you, Lord, that I have a plan, that you got vision for my life, amen? If today's message impacted you in any way and you wanna help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.